Buddha taught that the most helpful internal quality for cutting through the things that tie the mind down is what's called appropriate attention. The Pali term is yoni so manasikana. You learn how to look at your experience in an appropriate way, ask the right questions about it. When he gives examples of inappropriate attention, it's questions about who am I, what am I, what, do, what was I in the past, what will I be in the future. All those questions of self-identity that everybody tells us are so important. And the boy says, hey, don't ask them. They're not worth it. They don't lead anywhere. The questions we do ask are the ones related to Four Noble Truths. Okay, where is stress right now? Where is the suffering right now? What's its cause? How does it end? What can you do to bring it to an end? Those are the questions that are worth asking. And you can ask these questions in ways that are helpful all along the path. The first ones are simple. In fact, the Buddha said the first questions you should ask a teacher when you go see the teacher is, what's skillful, what's unskillful? What, if I do it, will lead to long-term happiness? What will I do that will lead to long-term suffering? There are a couple of assumptions in here, but they're important ones. One is that your actions do make a difference. And it's possible to develop skill in your actions. How do you do it? Well, you just observe what you're doing and then look at the results. And if the results don't come out the way you want to, okay, go back and look what you did and make changes. start with the out, our outside actions and learn how to be skillful on the external level, and then we turn around and apply the same principle internally. In other words, you have to be sensitive to what you're doing. So, must, so many of us are not. We just kind of barge through life doing this, doing that, and say, gee, why? I wonder why that person is that way. I wonder why this situation is this way, without looking at what we did to make that person react in that way, make the situation come out in this particular way. Act as if it was just simply a given that was there. And we're remarkably un insensitive to what we do that creates the situations we experience, in particular that creates the problems we experience. So the Buddha says, turn around, look at your actions, look at what you do, look at what you say. This is a lot of it's one of the reasons why he has this work with the precepts as a basis for the practice. Just get sensitive to what you're doing. Put some bounds on your actions. Have principles in what you do, and then see what happens as a result. And you find that life begins to clean up. You're creating fewer and fewer issues for yourself, fewer and fewer problems for yourself. And then you turn around and use the same principle as you meditate. The sensitivity that you've developed in the course of observing the precepts, then gets put to use in an even more refined area. What are you doing with your mind right now? Okay, what intentions do you have? Okay, for the time being, we're focused on the breath. What else is the mind doing now? Because oftentimes the mind is like a committee. There are lots of little voices and lots of little agendas in there. And as you're working on concentration, you've got to learn to sort those other voices out. Be sensitive to them and learn how to keep them quiet. Not get pulled away by them. And again, the question is, how do you do this most skillfully? And there are basic principles that you can learn from other people, but a lot of it comes from just your own dealings with your own inner voices. Learning how, learning how to re recognize the distraction when it comes and just not get involved. Learning how to notice when the mind seems to be ready to move off. In other words, it begins to get bored with the breath and starts 
searching around for something else. Even though it's still with the breath, it's beginning to move a little bit. So once you can sense, when you can sense that, you can cut off those distractions even before they happen. This way you find you get more and more skillful at staying with the breath in the present moment. And then you try to make yourself comfortable with the breath. Actually, the two processes go together. If the breath isn't comfortable, it's hard to stay with it. So during the times when you are with the breath, try to make it as comfortable as you can. And this little exercise that John Lee sets out for you so to learn how to breathe comfortably, it's very important because it begins to sensitize you to the various things that you do in the present moment that make yourself uncomfortable. You start with the breathing, and then from there you go into noticing things that the mind does. It all comes under that principle of appropriate attention. Ask questions, okay, where is there discomfort? What, you, what can you do to change it? In other words, instead of trying to stamp out the discomfort immediately, notice, okay, what else is going along with it? Because that's causing the discomfort. You cut it off at the cause, rather than trying, trying to smash it out at the result. So you work with the breath. Get sensitive to know, okay, when the breath has come in just enough, when it's gone out just enough, when you're pushing and pulling it too much. You watch and observe and you make adjustments. When things get comfortable, you try to spread that sense of comfort throughout the body. There are several reasons for this. One is that you want to make the present as comfortable a place as possible. And secondly, you want to learn how to expand the radius of your gaze. In other words, instead of just looking in one direction, you want to learn how to look 360 degrees all around you. Because this is where a lot of insight is. It's catching things that normally happen sort of behind your back or in your blind spot. And you learn how to make your gaze all around. Then you start seeing things that you didn't notice before. There are basically two ways of getting the mind to settle down. One is to focus it on one's one very restricted area and just really forcing it to stay there, blanking out everything else. You can get into very strong states of concentration that way, but they're the type of concentration that actually prevents insight from arising. Because that blanking out gives a lot of room for denial and the sort of stashing way that most people like to do with it unpleasant things in their own minds, the things they don't want to see, things they don't want to deal with. Whereas if you can make your gaze more all around, if your concentration is the type where it is centered at one spot, but there's a sense that your awareness radiates out from that spot to fill everything, that's the kind of concentration that can lead to insight. They can help get rid of those blind spots that we carry around with us all the time. Because whatever direction a thought may come from you, you can see it coming. Because your gaze is all around. And whatever would disturb you to concentration, you can see it and deal with it right away. And you find you get the mind in some very good, solid states. That's why states that are not affected by opening your eyes, getting up, moving around. This is the kind of concentration that you can maintain in all kinds of activities. And once you have the sense of continuity of course, between formally sitting and moving around and doing your daily activities, there seems to be the, the same centered state of awareness. It gets deeper, more solid, more solidly established. Then as you get more and more familiar with it, then you can ask those questions again, dealing with the Four Noble Truths. Okay, where even in this good, solid state is there a sense of stress? Look for it and see what you're doing that's causing that stress. So 
sometimes it takes a while to see it, but as your sensitivities get more refined and more developed, you begin to notice, oh yeah, there is stress here. And it's accompanied by this action, or this movement, this assumption. So you drop it. See what happens then. This way, begin to catch more and more subtle defilements at the same time that your concentration gets more solidly established. And this way, concentration and insight go together. Tranquility and insight go together. The emphasis may, see, may be somewhat different, but for, to get the best results, you want them working together. In other words, to try to get the mind as still as possible, but in a way that's still and alert and aware. And they can ask these questions, okay, where is the stress now? And they just sit there and watch. You have to be like a hunter. Hunters go out in the forest and they have to sit very still, so as not to scare the animals away. But they have to be very alert, so as not to miss the clues of when an animal is around, and they have to be very patient. They can't go out and say, well, at two o'clock I'll go get that animal and come back. They have no idea when it's going to come, back, come by, when they're going to get it. So they have to sit there and just be very, very patient, very consistently alert. to see what direction things will come from. It's the same when you meditate. You try to get the mind very still and then ask that question and then just watch. See if you can detect the stress, the movements of the mind that accompany the stress, the things that you can let go. You can't let go of the stress, but you can let go of the movements around it that accompany it. Notice how the Buddha describes the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. You learn how to comprehend stress, you let go of its cause. So first to comprehend it, you've got to see it. Once you see it, you have to learn how to watch it, notice its movements, and then notice what other movements there are in the mind that accompany it. Okay? Those are the things you let go. See what happens. So approach the meditation as you would any skill. It requires a lot of attention, a lot of patience, a lot of sensitivity to what you're doing. We're always doing something in the present moment. If we weren't any input in terms of intention in the present moment, we wouldn't experience space and time. So as long as there's space and time, there's an intention someplace. You want to learn how to watch for those intentions and peel them away. And where do you find them? Well, any place where there's stress, any place where there's discomfort in the mind. Look there. And if you don't see any, well, just sit and watch. Try to get yourself as still as possible. Remind yourself you're a hunter. And hunters can't be picky about when the rabbit's going to come and when it's not going to come. You just do your best to be as alert and as still as possible, asking yourself the right questions. The hunter would ask, okay, how would you recognize this animal? How would you recognize that animal? Well, the Buddha gives us the instructions on how to recognize the animals in the mind. Look for the stress. Look for the sense of being burdened in the mind. That's where all the issues are. And you don't have to trace them back to the past. It's the patterns that cause us to suffer are always being reenacted over and over again right now. And it's enough just to see them in the present moment to say, oh my gosh, the mind is doing that. There's really no need for it to do that. You drop it. This is how appropriate attention acts, functions in the mind. It helps get the mind still and also learns how to ask the right questions. What's going on here? And especially what's going on in terms of the stress, in terms of suffering. When you have the two of those qualities working together, the stillness and the questioning, the insight is going to have to come. 
You can't decide beforehand when it's going to come, but okay, you're always there ready for it. to see whatever moves. <laughs>